Uh, good morning, everyone. So everyone had their breakfast and ready for an exciting day of talks, I hope. <laughs> uh, so uh, what I'll discuss today is uh, how some of our experiences of uh, what we learned as well as the tools and techniques that you can use uh, when you're developing in a large mono repo, right? So, uh, so I am Jay. I work as a senior manager in Microsoft. Uh, so I'm from Bangalore, so it's, it's a lot uh, hotter here <laughs> and a lot less traffic as well. So I work uh, as, uh, I, our team builds a lot of search experiences for a product called Microsoft Search. So Microsoft Search is uh, like uh, a unique and cohesive search experience which we build across all Microsoft apps for all your work-based content, which can be like all Microsoft funded as well as the non-Microsoft apps that you use. Uh, so that's the app that I have. So essentially, uh, like, yeah, we work on uh, a search box, uh, which gives you sessions and then a bunch of search results. And as the complexity and based on the query as the confidence and uh, we have more uh, insights into what the results should be, we uh, also, of add a little more complex stuff in the search results, right? Uh, so one of the things that uh, we consider search as is a high value experience. So high value experiences are something that uh, we consider that are like most important user actions that are done across all the office apps and across devices as well, right? So these are some things that are used across the Microsoft Office suite. Uh, the other part that's, uh, Yeah. So the other part that we consider really important is coherence. So whenever we build these experiences, we want to ensure that uh, we have like a familiarity of the interactions as well as the experience across all these applications. So it, it could be like across Outlook, at, across Teams, across Word, Excel, PowerPoint as well, right? So across all these apps, it should feel similar as well as uh, it should have native device-based interactions, for example, if on a mobile device you have long press and things uh, like different uh, interactions like that, you should honor that as well uh, in the app, in the applications. So instead of search, I'll probably explain with a sim uh, slightly relatable uh, experience called People Card. Um, so People Card is something that we started uh, like a digital visiting card uh, across Microsoft apps. So it used to contain like contact information, uh, where you sit, who you report to, what's your structure and stuff. Uh, it slowly uh, kind of improved to a little more detailed information about your work profile and uh, your LinkedIn profile as well. Uh, and But over time, we added a lot more things to this people card, right? So you, you get in, insights of, uh, okay, if I have to set up a meeting, like what is a more convenient time between the two of us? Uh, like you have contact details, uh, your org structure, your recent documents, or like conversations between the two of you. And like, there's a lot more complexity that gets added. So given that the people card has, uh, in itself has got a lot more complexity, uh, like, like I said, and imagine this as like a common experience across all the applications like Word, Outlook, uh, Teams, uh, and like SharePoint and all these applications as well as on each device as well. Right. Uh, so for this, one of the things that you really need to, when you're developing these experiences, one of the things that you need to think about is agility, right? So when you're thinking of agility, I want to, I would like to put it into two loops. I call one as an inner loop and an outer loop. So in the inner loop, it's like what a developer does every day, like most of us, uh, write code, you test it, then you raise a pull request, someone reviews it, you get it merged into the uh, master branch. And then once it's merged in master branch, then you have like you release to different rings uh, in the production. And then you get feedback from the users, kind of uh, re add some more features and next steps uh, and write code again, right? So this kind of seems okay. So this is okay doable. But think of it when uh, you have to uh, do this across six platforms, right? So when you're doing it across Android, iOS, UWP, Win32, Web, and Mac. Mac OS. Uh, so a lot of times we kind of tend to have like uh, separate silos where or say like separate repos where all these components are developed and the source code is different. The teams that uh, the people that work on them are also different, right? So 
uh, given that it's very hard to get a product agility, importantly, where like you can't uh, release all of them simultaneously, you can't have, you can't share a lot of code, you have to redo a lot of stuff as well. So that's the reason we looked at uh, moving it to one a single source code repository uh, and kind of have like a community of developers who can add these components for all these endpoints, right? So just to summarize, so if you have like a people part of this, like this, uh, across all applications like Outlook, uh, OneDrive, uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Notebook, SharePoint, Teams, and then across six platforms, right? So when you're thinking of getting a good agility as well as ensuring there, there are, the experiences are coherent, uh, you have to remember one thing that uh, no one size fits everyone, right? So, uh, which means that you can't have like one solution which can work across all these endpoints, okay? So, to simplify that, one of the most important things that you have to do is uh, breaking things into small packages, breaking your code into small packages. So, that's the first thing that you have to think of doing. For example, for the people card, I would like to, uh, I mean, I would break it down into a people core package, then a people API package, uh, auth package, a data layer, and a bunch of components, and then a thin layer for each of the endpoints like Android, iOS, macOS, and so on, right? So, uh, so few things that you get a benefit out of when you break it into smaller packages are like reuse can be made easier when each package is, they have like a single responsibility, right? So, uh, you, each package knows what it needs to do, right? The other thing that it also does, it is it encourages developers to uh, have like additional thinking and develop uh, a little more uh, and thoughtfulness in how you expose the interfaces between the packages and how you ensure it's a unit in itself, right? Uh, it also encourages more of um, composition and reuse patterns as well. Right, and of course, like it's, if it's smaller, it can be published easily, made changes. You needn't worry about the entire universe, but ensure your block is, you know, getting published easily and released well. And that's why, like, you can also manage releases easily. Right. Uh, so, given all this, uh, when you have break your code down into multiple uh, repos, uh, this is what we call it as um, a mono repo, where you have like a repo which can publish multiple packages. Uh, <coughs> so. The main essence that mono repos bring is singularity in code, right? Uh, so, what is a mono repo? It is, uh, in general, to in short, uh, a repository with multiple packages, uh, right? So, why multiple packages? I think I've already touched upon this, but yeah, like other repositories. Think of, say, Teams app wants to use the org chart module in some. Uh, internal module in Teams, which is not related to people, right? So I can just reuse that org chart package uh, as a module in Teams, right? So uh, that is where it actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, it also ensures that uh, it behaves as a code reuse unit, it means like you can share a lot of tooling, uh, you can actually, uh, you know, share a lot of things so that the, uh, whatever you build are, is coherent enough, right? Uh, the other reasons why you want to put in one in the same repository are definitely like developer agility where uh, like as a developer you can actually move faster because you can reuse what other people have written as well, right? A lot of code consistency can be maintained so if you have the right linters uh, and uh, like some of the best practices followed you can have and if you put efforts to ensure it's homogeneous across the repo, any developer can easily figure out what's the code. Right, and uh, you can unify a lot of process like build, deploy, uh, and so on as well. Right, uh, code discoverability, CI, CD, and so on as well. Uh, so this is something that uh, helped us a lot moving to a mono repo structure because think of uh, like in Microsoft in general, there are about uh, I think about hundred thousand developers across the company, and uh, you have like so many applications and there are about uh, 200 packages that we publish in that mono repo and uh, more than 400 developers who, who are working on that repo, right? So that way it actually helps a lot when you kind of uh, simplify your code into smaller packages uh, and kind of reuse a lot of uh, tooling, uh, release processes, a lot of uh, other things that you get in a, in, in a single repo, right? 
so one one of the major things that you need when you're moving to a uh, mono repo is like you need lots of good tooling right so some good tooling around package management uh, the whole package life cycle how you publish it how can you make it common and easy for every developer uh, <coughs> cross package orchestrators so when i by this i mean like something that you want to run across all packages uh, uh, simultaneously or like uniformly rather uh so that's another thing that you need because now uh, instead of a single repo now you have a lot of smaller repos of sort right like it i mean you think when like before we used to have like one repo per package uh, but now if you are plugging in a lot more packages in the same repo you need a lot more cross package stuff right of course a lot of common things like linters uh, testing tools uh build system infrastructure uh so the bottom three and like more like that's something that you can add by yourself but uh two key things that you definitely should have in a mono repo and consider uh, thinking about it are like package management and uh, cross package orchestrators so we'll uh, look at these two in detail in this talk uh, so let's start with package management right uh, so earlier you had like a one single javascript package now when you have a repo you have uh like multiple packages in the same repo right so uh like like i said in our repo there are about 200 packages that get published uh and then if you look at the external dependencies that it brings in it's a whole lot more right so you have to deal with this entirety of uh, number of packages uh for uh, even to start development right uh so let's try to understand how packages uh, work in in a node development scenario right so uh, you write the package configuration in a package json file everything understands this right uh, so you install it with your favorite tool npm or yarn and uh, what this does is it fetches your package content from somewhere and puts it in your uh, hard disk right uh, now when you think of node in execution uh, whenever you require a module right node essentially uh, looks wants to look for a file which can give what is the module and it will essentially resolve it that right? so if you kind of separate these two concepts in mind uh we can kind of understand how node modules also like uh, resolves your uh, modules so like whenever you say require react uh first node tries to look at uh, your current package node modules folder if it's not found there it will do one up and try to see in packages folder and then uh, like and so on and so forth until it it can go to the root folder right so this this is how node tries to resolve uh, for a module uh, like availability of a file on the disk uh, in this fashion right so so like you have like uh, package 1 and package 2 in two repositories now we are trying to put it in a single mono repo right uh, and these have their own dependencies like for uh, in this example package 1 has uh, a b c dependencies and then uh, say package 2 has a dependency on uh, b uh, you can see that uh, b version 1 is a common dependency between the two so when we try to do uh, an npm install it will try to uh, install two uh, copies of the same version of b right so now let's if you understood like since we saw how node module resolves uh, uh the structure uh, like how it resolves a package uh, if you kind of move this node modules folder to the parent folder which is of the mono repo uh, in the node modules folder you can add a b c and then of course like uh, the, since there's a different version of uh, b for uh, c1.0 like it still maintains that order uh so this way you are kind of deduping uh the installation of b right so there's only one copy of it that gets installed uh in a mono repo the other things that you also would want to do is to create symlinks of the packages within the uh mono repo uh say later on i want to add a package 3 which can take a dependency on package 1 uh you needn't install it again right it's already present uh so given so this concept is called uh, package hoisting uh so uh so when you try to move the package installation to a parent folder kind of hoist the package installation 
right so uh, a bunch of tools help you uh, do achieve this right you have uh, rush js which is something microsoft open source a while back and you also have yarn workspaces a lot of us use yarn so yarn workspaces is an easy uh, understandable thing uh, we also have uh, you can also use pnpm workspaces if you are using pnpm as your package manager then there's also another popular uh, open source uh, library called learner which you can use for package management as well uh so i'll just walk through one of them which we use in our mono repo but a lot of concepts are similar right uh, so we use yarn workspaces uh, so here uh, to use yarn workspaces you have to do a couple of small changes to your package json uh, you have to ensure that this you add a new package json at your mono repo folder right uh, so it's not inside the uh, per package package json you add a package json to the mono repo folder right so in this essentially what all you need to do is you have to ensure that uh, you set a uh, private to true right uh, and you add another object called workspaces uh, here you you can give a list of what packages you want to be managed in this workspace right so if you want you can give a list of packages or you can also use a regex so this is generally how most of us do if you want to keep adding new packages to that folder you just give a regex path right uh, optionally you can also specify okay so for some packages you don't want to hoist it you want to manage the dependencies internally you can still achieve that uh, where you can add a no hoist uh, key with uh the packages where you don't want to hoist packages right um and the other thing the other changes you have to run yarn from the root of the mono repo right so when you run yarn now uh the package installation uh it came down from about 20 minutes so every day like when you do a git pull from master and then you try to uh, do a yarn uh it used to take a much longer time now it reduced to 6 minutes we are working to bring that further uh lower right but yeah this is something that uh like using workspaces can really help you and understanding this uh concept of hoisting packages will actually help you a, a lot in ensuring you don't have to uh, you know reinstall a lot of uh, duplicate copies uh so the other part that we talked about was cross package orchestration uh right so in general for a uh, package itself you have a lot of things to do this this like a subset of what i could fit into the viewport of the things that we do on a package right so you, we have like a bunch of pre built things you can do uh, you have some generator commands you you have some linters you have some test commands that you want to run and so on right uh, of course watch as well uh, so given all this you want to kind of have the if you're a developer and you're breaking your larger package into smaller packages which means like you want to have a same way of uh, running the same set of commands that you can run across packages right uh, this means that uh, you need to have like a homogeneous way to run uh, these commands or your day to day activities across packages not just your set of packages the packages that you own but also like you can easily do the same for uh, other people uh, code as well which which has been added to the mono repo uh so for cross package orchestration again we have uh, a bunch of tools uh, so russian learner feature here uh, russian learner feature here again uh, so these help you to kind of uh, run uh, tasks across all these packages in a uniform manner uh, you can also use gulp uh, shell scripts simple sh shell scripts or we also recently added just scripts which is like where if you have a lot of custom uh, scripts already which you want to add you can use them as well uh, but yeah like russian learner kind of have a lot of out of the box things that you can directly use uh, others you can just tune it if you want a lot more fine tuning for your repo you can use the others as well right uh, so we use learner in our uh, mono repo so i'll just talk through it uh, through a couple of slides uh so for using learner you need to add a config uh file called learner json uh in the mono repos root folder right uh so few things that you need to add are okay across what all package paths uh, should i run this command should learner run this command 
So you can give the list of packages where you want to run the learner commands. Uh, you also specify uh, which NPM client you use. So it could be YARN, it could be PNPM, it could be NPM, right? And you also uh, usually set uh, use workspaces true if you're using uh, a YARN workspace, right? So, uh, and then it's as simple as doing learner run and you give one script to run. So Lerna has a lot of optimizations uh, where it looks at the package dependencies and tries to uh, see if it can parallelize execution of these steps. For example, if there are three packages which are dependent on each other, uh, probably they it cannot run parallelly, uh, whereas uh, for other packages, it can simultaneously run the same script, right? So that way it saves a lot of time. Of course, it also uh, occupies more memory, but uh, given for developer productivity and if we have like decent machines, this is something that uh, really helps us a lot, right? Uh, <laughs> So the other thing that it also does is, uh, of course, like since it's one source for running commands, you can optimize a lot uh, in your developer workflow as well. Uh, so apart from running commands, uh, we also use Learner. Uh, Learner also for a few other things. Uh, one of the things is versioning. Uh, so when you have to manage package versions, uh, it might become a nightmare where uh, you have like interdependent, in uh, like packages in the same mono repo, say package B depends on package A, and then uh, you are changing package A but forgot to update the dependency of package B, uh, or like managing dependencies uh, or versions of packages across uh, all these, right? Uh, so it gives a nice nifty way to handle that. So you have a bunch of commands, like learn up, publish, you can use to create new release versions. So you can customize how the release versions look like and so on. Uh, then you can also do a learner diff uh, and you can give it for a specific package also. Uh, so it can give like, if you do a learner diff on the root of Mona repo, it gives what all has changed since the last released version, right? So what all packages have changed. So you get a nice change log uh, of sorts as well as like the differences in the code, the diff, code, right? Uh, so learner changed gives uh, the change log. Uh, so using all this, you can actually uh, run uh, like manage versioning a lot easier. So because you might, so uh, we kind of have weekly releases to production. So we publish a new package version usually every week, uh, but the smaller packages might be done uh, through the week, right? So uh, we kind of uh, use this uh, to manage versioning. So it becomes a lot easier to uh, manage all of that. Uh, the other important part, which I really like is, uh, so in our mono repo, we have like different high value experiences, right? One of them was search, uh, which I work on. Then we also have uh, people experience on the same repo. Uh, you have uh, like another feed processing uh, feed uh, app as well. So we have like a bunch of, uh, and a lot more apps. Uh, so for all of this developing, when you are when you have to develop these, uh, and build these uh, experiences, like push these experiences in multiple apps, like Outlook, Word, there are like a big array of apps that I want to push these experiences to, right? So, but as a developer, I can't, you know, run all of those and test against those when I'm actually writing code. So we actually use something like a test dev app. We have like a test app where you just build these components, test them properly, and then release a version, which is integrated into these applications. Right, so uh, Lerna has a nice way to scope commands uh, to the dependencies of a certain package. So I can do like, uh, when I'm, uh, say, let me call the uh, dev app for search as search dev app, and I have a package for that. So when I do Lerna run scope uh, search dev app, it will figure out what are the dependencies for it and only runs Lerna, and you can do Lerna watch across all of those dependent packages for the search dev app, right? So I need to just run one command uh, using which, I, so it kind of, when I run uh, Lerna, uh, I want to watch, so, I, uh, so when I do Lerna run watch uh, for, and with a scope of search dev app uh, here, it kind of uh, runs this NPM, uh, NPM run watch on all the dependence, all the dependencies of search dev app like you can see search conf, uh, search dispatcher, a bunch of search data layer, search logger, and so on, right? So you have all the packages that search dev app uses, the watch is run on all of them. And this is something that is 
uh, figured automatically by Lerner, uh, right? So uh, this way, like adding new packages, you can easily uh, keep running the watch on the parent, uh, like the dev app package, and you can still, uh, if you make any changes, you can still uh, develop a lot more efficiently, right? So these are some of the wins that Lerner brings in. So uh, it actually brought down our build times by about five times as well because there's a uh, good amount of optimization in how uh, uh, it optimizes for uh, running the process. It has a good community adoption as well uh, across, like there are a lot of open source repos which use Lerner. Uh, but yeah, summing it up, uh, you want to ensure that you pick the right tools for your mono repo uh, based on the complexity of uh, the packages, right? So in our mono repo, we have about 200 packages. So, so we actually invest a lot more in tooling uh, so that it, it can make life easier for 400 plus developers. Mm -hmm. But if it's a smaller scale, maybe you don't need so much. So pick the right tools for your repo. For linting, unit test, functional perf testing, you can use the tools that you have, combine it with uh, Lerna or other, uh, like other package management things for making this more useful. Uh, if you're using TypeScript, then uh, of course like handle a TypeScript compilation also uh, as an extra step. Uh, so for the content that I used in this talk, uh, there are some of the links that I've, uh, helpful links, uh, which give you more information on these tools uh, that I've talked about. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for uh, mm -hmm. sitting through my talk. Uh, so any questions? It's a question there, yeah. Uh, you, yeah, you talked about no hoist for uh, stopping auto hoisting in YAN packages, in uh -huh. workspaces. Available only for uh, workspaces now, or is it available for public as well? Uh, sorry, could you, I couldn't hear the last part clearly. Right. Is it available for public workspaces as well now? Yeah, yeah, it is available for workspaces now. Yeah. So, the no hoist configuration is something that you are putting for YARN workspaces, right? So it's actually a workspace configuration that you can have. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if there are, uh, if you have more questions, feel free to catch me around, I'll be- Just, just one second, one question from <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> uh, so you showed a uh, screenshot of people and so yeah. is it only the mono repo for people then or you have uh, like many other functional topics built into say 200 yeah, sub modules so, into what so, is the mono uh, Correct. Yeah. So as I said like our mono repo consists experiences for uh, people search uh, like the search box and search results components. Uh, as well as we also have for uh, a bunch of other things like feed app, we have uh, a Microsoft search in Bing app as well. So we have multiple other uh, high value experiences which are used across uh, like all of Microsoft apps. Uh, so it's not just a f one mono repo for people because even within these, we use, uh, reuse a lot of components uh, like uh, like the data layer that we, all of this talk to, we kind of try to build like one platform uh, API using which we can get all this uh, information because you want to use a lot of intelligent signals across all these apps uh, from one layer uh, which can abstract you into other downstream platforms. So essentially what I wanted to un understand was where do you draw the line as to what should not go in this mono repo but it belongs there. Uh, so as I said like for our I mean, it's just for our mono repo, right? Ours is one of the mono repos in Microsoft. So our mono repos, we have uh, uh, like these high value experiences only, uh, but we also have a lot of uh, mono repos for the applications itself. Like Outlook has its own mono repo, uh, SharePoint has its own mono repo and so on. So uh, again, like depending on, since these are pub like all these experiences are published as packages, we don't have like a deployment into a server of sorts for these uh, high value experiences. But for app specific uh, mono repos, you need that deployment level optimization mm -hmm. as well. And so, so. yeah, uh, any other questions? Uh, you can catch me anytime during the day. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, and I think over to the next talk. Have a great conference. And uh, I really want to thank all the organizers. Uh,
uh, as well uh, and the sponsors for this event. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Jay. Thank you.